Public domain Mickey Mouse, you say. That's all well and good, but let's take a look at some comics by people who got in some major trouble from the Walt Disney Corporation when they did their own Mickey Mouse parody. Welcome to your favorite YouTube channel, Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name is Ed Piscor. I'm Jim Rugg. We're going to be talking copyright. We're going to be talking public domain. We're going to be talking Mickey Mouse today here on the channel. But first, you must realize we are a, a daily YouTube channel with more than 1,700 videos at your disposal. Good chance we talked about your favorite comics. So hit the magnifying glass on the front page, give the channel a search, and check out those, those episodes. Getting uh, very close to having 100,000 subscribers. We're very excited to hit that, uh, hit that sort of goal. And uh, you can subscribe to the channel, cost you nothing, jump on board, and with that you get delivered the videos as soon as we put them live. Uh, if you want access to the videos that we put together before anybody else, mitigate that kayfabe effect, because whenever we talk about something, it disappears offline pretty rapidly. Become a King Kayfaber on our Patreon. A lot of them are hanging out with us in this chat room right at this very moment, and they all get access to the videos before anybody else. And without further ado, Jimmy, let's pop into uh, checking out Mickey Mouse Meets the Air Pirates Funnies, number one and number two, two, two comics. Uh, this covers by Bobby London, and I feel like it is like channeling Floyd Gottfriedson like no other. I wouldn't be surprised if this is like a lightbox job or wow. something. It, I mean, it just feels so perfect. I mean, I'll, I'll, maybe his contribution to the gimmick is the dope on the back. <laughs> Which, which would make it pretty good for uh, parody kind of uh, use. Still hippie shit. This is 1971. I thought we should put this under the microscope with everybody fucking waxing all over the place. Now that uh, the original Mickey Mouse character has finally has hit, hit the public domain. Uh, and people have been doing their versions and calling them the mouse and, and all this kind of stuff. Let's take a look at some comics when, when people were taking some real chances. And uh, the Air Pirates spearheaded by Dan O'Neill... He's one of those hippie rebel rouser guys. I was watching a video with him that was sort of uh, inspired by the Air Pirates funnies. And uh, in modern day, whenever this film thing was filmed, like in the 80s, like Queen Elizabeth was going to be like, maybe she doesn't take planes or something and, and just like use charters boats. But the Queen was going to be docking or something in, in like the harbor in San Francisco. So Dan O'Neill took a crew of dudes out into the middle of the harbor with just the as much Wonder Bread as they could get and were just feeding tons of seagulls because they were like, it just takes one of these seagulls to shit on her. <laughs> He's that dude, man. And, and, and they had this video. Really, you could see the video. You could watch him doing it. And they're just out in the fucking middle of the ocean or whatever that is. Wow. Brackish water feeding the, a ton and they're being hounded bombarded by these seagulls and he's like it's just going to take one it was just one of these seagulls has to do the job that's hilarious so that's the dude he wanted to be sued yes he did yeah that that seemed deliberate uh i started syndicating comics in i think like 63 or something yeah odd bodkins and even that comic he was nervous that you know the san francisco examiner whatever paper that it appeared in that they were going to toss him out and run wild with the copyright and have some jobber come in and do it. So he started drawing Disney characters into the strip way back then to the point he got fired three times. Yes. And they got to keep the uh, copyright. Right. And uh, I think he was the youngest guy syndicated, at least up to that point. So so young dude, which means lots of energy right. to pursue this stuff. And then <sighs> once he enters litigation... It seems like he has his own agenda for that, where like he, I believe, if I understand it right, he wanted this to be treated as First Amendment stuff, right. with, like a freedom of speech issue. Right. So, yeah, a, a whew, pretty pretty legendary, but man, fighting fighting the mouse. Yeah, and it was, uh, there's that one guy that it's, like... It's probably, that's probably the Disney boogeyman establishment for like everybody that followed is like, don't mess with Disney. Totally. And, and uh, he, there's like conversations between he himself and uh famous like copyright attorneys and dan o'neill's like we won and the attorneys were like no dude you set parody back 30 years right so it's 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 murky like there, there's no 
it's not science. Like there's not a quantifiable metric of like how, how this thing all play out. We, we, we could speak, we could speak the facts of like what, what we do know, uh, happen. This video is brought to you by the comics that we make. Switchblade Shorty is now appearing on the cartoonist Kayfabe and Ed Piscor social media every day. Hip Hop Family Tree, The Omnibus, Red Room, Crypto Killers, Antisocial Network, and Trigger Warnings, and X Men Grand Design Trade Paperback. Street Angel, Princess of Poverty, Street Angel, Deadly Girl Alive, True Crime Funnies, BW Zine, 1986 Zine, and Hulk Grand Design. And now back to the video. But uh, the Pirates, as of the publication of these two issues, Dan O'Neill, Ted Richards, Gary Halgren, Bobby London. Another person who is associated with them is Sherry Flanagan, but she's not in any of these comics. And the connective tissue with these people are that they are students of cartooning and comics. So they are pulling from, like, Polly and her pals, like Cliff Sterritt's, and uh, Floyd Gottfriedson. George Harriman. Harriman with, um, this is Bobby London. And and Bobby London will do, um, Dirty Duck has a big legacy. Yeah. Like when we were kids, it was in Playboy. Oh, like, I didn't realize like that. Like it had a six panel, like a Sunday strip kind of thing, like, like in Playboy magazine when we were growing up. Uh, he took over um, Popeye duties mm -hmm. for a good chunk of the 80s. So these guys like have legitimate care for the craft of comics which you couldn't take for granted with the underground guys because so much of it was just dick sucking robert crumb right guys that had a, some drawing proficiency and like saw that crumb was popular they wanted to get chicks at the same level i'm gonna make a comic yeah and you can kind of see how you go from okay here's one taboo let's draw sex in our comic to let's confront copyright law right you know, like like it's kind of Underground is, if you're viewing it as we're breaking taboos, we're, we're pushing these boundaries, you can kind of see how they're related, even though in a lot of ways it couldn't be more different. It gets deep. Like, this comic gets deep because we got our harem and stuff. We have, uh, you know, the the Cliff Starrett's kind of stuff. We we have, like, all of these, uh, you know, Otto Soglo, like, like these deep cut. Like, in 1971, where are you getting this stuff? That's very true. And, but it's, it's a lot of um, comics that precedes, precedes Disney's kind of monolithic status. Right. So it's like they're taking the great stuff of the early comics and they're really criticizing this corporate, placid, saccharine, pussy, fucking Disney stuff. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's very punk rock. The way that uh, London is formatting these pages, and there's going to be a couple pages we're just going to skip through real fast and stuff. But and and and, and if if I'm missing something, you just skip the page. But uh, he's really great at playing with the uh, compositions of these pages. Yeah, as somebody who has, um, you know, kind of aped styles. Yeah, I have such admiration for for what you're seeing on display here because I love Harriman, and right. it's like he's doing lettering stuff. Like it's it's really impressive, and it does make me wonder, like. Is he going to library to like study these? Because how hard would it be to get your hands on this stuff at, at that time period? As you, you say, you know what is interesting is that Bill Blackbeard is a San Fran dude, so they know him. It's not like Bill Blackbeard started collecting that shit in like 1985. Yeah, I mean, can you imagine too if you're a lover of classic comics and you find Bill Blackbeard, right? Dude, you'd be you'd be like living in his basement. <laughs> what this what this specific comic is, I think it's a play on that um, Fritz the Cat, and I'm, and I'm hiding some stuff. Uh, it's a play on that Fritz the Cat that um, Kurtzman commissioned in Help magazine, where it's like the cats are peeling lace off each other and like writhing around on one another. I, I think that that's like a part of that inspiration. But yeah, dude, it's all here, dude, and it's it's pitch perfect. Uh, Kind of big forearms, so you could see the cigar love, and even the lettering maybe is a little cigarish, more than uh, Harriman-ish. It, it is more legible than Harriman. It would probably be the one place where you see some deviation, but like the titles and stuff, you know, it, it's it's pretty good attention to detail, in my opinion. Yeah, totally. And then uh, with silly sympathies uh, in the Walt Disney comics and stories, the places where a lot of the Duck comics would would show up before it had its own title. There would be the bug comics that were kind of formatted very very closely 
to this as well. So these are the cartoonists, like, they remember a time before Disney was such a fucking thing. They could speak this cartoon language and deliver it in a way that everybody kind of rem- would remember. You know, anybody off the street has those relationships probably with the old comics and what Disney has become. And one of the things that uh, O'Neill did was he knew somebody who was related, who had a father, who was an executive at at, uh, Disney. And the way that he suggested was like, the dude he knew uh, is a gay kid, gay guy. And, and the way he talks about that dude is like, he's exiled from Disney. Like, like the executive doesn't even like let his coworkers know that he has a gay son. There's like so much shame and stuff. Somehow the kid, he's not a kid, he's a bar, but bartender was able to get copies into like a boardroom. Right. So it's like to make sure that these guys all saw this stuff and we got to kind of go through that part real quick. Yeah. I, I, I did have trouble trying to figure out what was accomplished. You know, that idea of like, he said, O'Neill says that he won I don't understand that. I don't understand that claim. <laughs> it's these um, misguided hippie do-gooder guys. I remember when the the G twenty came to came to Pittsburgh that whatever whatever year that was, and there was a, a guy who looked like Dan O'Neill. It wasn't Dan O'Neill, but it was like an old fart hippie dude with the beard with the mustache yeah. and stuff. And he gets in front of the what would you call it a phalanx of of cops with their batons and their and their shields and stuff, and. Of course, 20 of the world's leaders come to Pittsburgh. There's going to be lots of cameras and stuff. So this was like live footage, uh, I think like by Polish Hill or like like someplace over there where that kind of shit goes on. And this hippie Dan O'Neill looking guy just sat down in front of the cops and he was like defiant and he like put up two like peace signs and they just like waited him out. Because <laughs> it's like, yeah, how long do you want to keep your hands up? And it was funny because this is an old dude who probably, you know, new people at Kent State and shit. They were like his peers. And he's got his two hands up. And then those hands came down in a couple minutes and then they picked his ass up and took him away. It was just a... It was corny. O'Neill, he's 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 being a chaos agent. This is Ted Richards. Dope and Dan was his was his comic. And and I guess I guess uh the influence for Dope and Dan is like a like a um like Mort Walker mm-hmm. kind of energy. Yeah the drawing's so impressive. Yeah the gang's all here that's Allegrin, the Cliff Starrett's type dude. And I guess the Airprites, they even make, make mention of stuff like the, um, the, the killer, bl- like the, the blot character. Yeah. Like these are all fucking Floyd Godfordson. Like, is this story even in the, um, Smithsonian book? And the Smithsonian book that came out after. So like these guys, they're deep. Yes. I, I, that's a question, you know, I, I wonder how they, uh, were aware of of uh, of the comics, it's so interesting to see this within the context of the undergrounds too. You know, it's such a different look. Yeah, it is. It is. I mean, it's a very focused approach because uh, many of those comics might have a little bit of a theme associated, but this seems to be like the most focused, where it's like each of us is pulling from a different, a different um, classic comic. Totally. Yeah. Yeah, it was interesting, like, going through the copyright stuff about Mickey and how that all works, because he's trademark and copyright, and yeah. it's all the new iterations, you know, new, I say new, since, like, Steamboat Willie, and there's one other one that, that was, like, uh, same year that was Mickey Mouse. Right. But the newer versions, you know, like a Fantasia or whatever, remains copyrighted. You exactly. Know? Like that stuff is, like, rolling as the years go by, but they maintain the trademark. And so, like, my reading of it is... You can't create confusion as to, is this a Disney Mickey Mouse right. in the stuff that you do? And in a lot of ways, like... This is as close as you could get. Yeah. Like, you can't put this comic out today. They'll, right. they'll, they'll, come, they'll come get you. Uh, funny that there's a subscription. <laughs> what have we said about the independent comics and the subscriptions? Like, uh, that is separating a fool from their money. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> crowdfunding has gotten i bet a lot more efficient in delivering you know they, they've raised a percentage of if you if you support this crowdfund i think you're more likely to get the books than these subscriptions right and you could fuck people off probably once and then that's, that's right it too yeah that's it so there were two issues great stuff man you think marker with the background there 
I can't even guess. I because then are you shooting it for color to get your separations? Right. You know, I I don't know. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, it looks like it. It certainly doesn't look like they're cutting separations. Building the figures like like the Godfredson uh, uh, strip stuff. You know, I think Batman is coming coming up uh, so- sooner than later, and people were talking about how how that's going to play out. And and uh, everybody's like so. There would be threads where people are so excited about these like big epic that they're going to do and stuff. And it's like no, like yeah, it's it's it's, not Joker. it's it's Batman. It's not Joker. It's not Gotham City. It's not Batmobiles. Like all that shit <laughs> comes comes later. Yeah, it's just a crazy dude in a costume <laughs> yeah yeah the phantom blot catching everybody up to speed and see they all cut their teeth on those uh, barks comics i thought this was a stellarly drawn strip like look at the great animation to it and the great cartooning beautiful line but but a line that you that would be considered unprofessional in a disney kind of yeah, like right. it's, it's wobbly yeah. and stuff you know like it's a bakshi line we'll call it what a page. I mean, look at the detail that's on that for just a standard comic book page. I think that Halligren of this crew like is like one of the standouts for sure. They they all have their strengths, no doubt, man. But again, you can see the the confusion over what are we looking at? And you you get a you know like the way a lot of like a cracked or mad you you do it once. Right. You don't get to do a series right. that, that looks like this. Look at this. That's an incredible piece of art right there. You can find these comics on eBay. Mm-hmm. Run you a couple hundred bucks a piece, uh, but you could find them on like archive.org. Like I said, you could they're they're accessible and you could you could check them out. And I do think that uh, they're 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 essential to have just digitally or, or or analog, just because of the historic significance. You got you got to you got to rest your eyes on these things. So of course you got your big bad wolf. They call him Zeke Wolf in here. Damn near uh, Easy Rider, fellas. So they went through the whole Court of Appeals stuff, and f- this comes out in 71, even into the early 80s. Dan O'Neill still fighting them. It's like, I think Dan O'Neill was like a million bucks in the hole on paper or something. I think the final ruling was two million. And that's the legal fees, and then there was like another fine. Something like that. I think that was the penalty. I think that was the penalty. It may have ruled some of the legal fees in or whatever. Yeah. And I think the understanding, because like Ron Turner from Last Gasp had dropped out of the lawsuit earlier. Right. I think his settlement was like 85000 and destroy all the copies and stuff. But I think in both cases, it was kind of understood, if you don't do this again, we're not going to come after you for the money in both cases. Now, I don't know if Dan O'Neill, like what the deal was, if it was like, I'm going to keep doing it and just not pay at the same time but right. i think with ron o'neill it was like yeah we, ron turner or ron ron turner uh man old brain superfly yes. is that ron o'neill <laughs> yeah i don't know if that one maybe <laughs> but uh you know i think the understanding was yeah uh this was the settlement you know like it was an agreed to settlement i believe so you know the tip is if you're going to do the the copyright the the now free copyright mickey mouse no white gloves Oh, really? Yeah, that's a later uh, edition. I see. Not much later, though. If you can hold out on your Mickey Mouse comic for like two more years or so. I, I can't remember exactly when those gloves appear, but it's it's pretty soon. There is... Uh, I, I did kind of like a Mickey Radish kind of um, character in, in the Switchblade Shorties comic. Just ra- randomly, you know? Like, I needed a rat, and I didn't want to research how to draw a good cartoon rat, so I did uh, um, um, Airzat's radish kind of, and that came out three days ago and i said you know public domain mickey mouse but that was i didn't know that wasn't yeah. the intention or anything it'll be interesting when somebody actually does something the great substantial one. yeah you know yeah do the great one bobby london is a bad motherfucker dude it was also interesting like reading up on it and seeing like what other characters are out there you know because so many characters have entered public domain from like literary backgrounds and things you know the the uh it's been sherlock holmes stuff like that it you know, would, like there's a lot of really great characters and i to some extent alan moore explored that with the league of extraordinary gentlemen i would say i've been conscious of it for probably the past five years at the turn of the calendar um there would be articles that would give a list and i think it's becoming more and more 
precious because it's like more and more relatable stuff that has like stood the test of time for a long time. Yeah. So like people are getting stoked. Cause I remember like some years ago, or maybe honestly, maybe it was really just this with this past round, but it was like Canterbury tales. And it's like, yeah, whatever. Had to got forced to read that shit in, in high school. I remember they called an asshole a nether eye, but, uh, I'm not, I'm not jumping to fucking do a Canterbury tales adaptation, but when you got something like Mickey, cause then, you know, Superman is coming, you know, Batman is coming, you know, Betty Boop is coming, like, like shit that like has stood the test of time in pop culture. It's fun. I think the other thing that this case could have, um, I, again, I hate to say victory, but it draws attention to how, you know, Disney was kind of rewriting copyright laws too. Oh yeah. And, and I think that that's why everybody's like really celebrating because they really pushed back the dates yes. many times. And, uh, they finally just, I, would they, they just threw their hands up or like, they just got, got tired. They didn't want to push it some more. Cause like we always had the impression that this will always happen. Right. Where they'll just always continue to push it because it was substantial. Like I, like I don't remember exactly, but it was like after the death of the creator, it was like X amount of time or something. And it far exceeded that. But then it started to have implications of just standard education, like art history and stuff. Art history, textbooks and things, like end before abstract expressionism for, for those exact reasons, because you know what your college textbooks cost and you, you know them shits ain't the textbooks we're getting at Barrett Elementary. So people got to get paid. You got, these things have to be licensed to like be in there and shit. And it, that's where you get into stuff like fair use, right? Which is probably another thing that may have been so much of this stuff is subjective to law interpretation. And so like, you know, I think that's where you fight some of these battles to kind of like clarify that so that we can have examples in art history books, you know, where, where it really is like, this is really, educational you can't not have this and say it's art history we're gonna have blank spaces where you know big things happen yeah so i mean it's murky there's a lot of stuff that i think you can look at and say yeah that's legal but you may get sued over it totally and then and then it got to come out in the wash and who has the money to fight exactly. this person or that person and uh you know it, there are there are cultural implications for sure and there is a like copyright law set, set up for a reason and 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 obviously you want to steal people's intellectual property. And if they make something great, like, of course, why not have like a generation or two, like a oh, prosper and benefit from that, or, you know, some d direct descendants and things. But at a certain point, you got to stop being a Nepo baby. Good to go. <laughs> yes. Okay. Fabers like follow, subscribe to the YouTube channel, hit the bell so that we can notify you when new videos are available. We're getting close to hundred thousand subscribers. If you haven't done so, man, make sure you subscribe to the channel, hit whatever extra buttons are required for you to get delivered these uh, videos so that you could be one of the earliest people on gen pop to get your hands on uh, the stuff that we're talking about. Uh, that'll mitigate the kayfabe effect to some extent, but if you want to get these videos before anybody else, you got to become a uh, patron on our Patreon. Uh, the King K Fibbers get all the vids and they uh, are able to kick it with us in this live stream chat room as we record uh, the week's videos, which uh, provides a lot of uh, extra value. Ultimately, though, the videos are brought to you by the books that we make. Jimmy, let the people know what you have. I have the 1986 zine and the BW zine. These have been out of print for a while. I sent a reprint out. They should be back. March 6th, they are going to be up for sale on my website. So if you miss them, they are coming back along with True Crime Funnies, my uh, collection of nonfiction short stories. And uh, I've actually finished the second drawing, the second chapter in my George White story. And that is available right now on my Patreon. You can see the original art from that one. If you're not a member, you can see it as soon as you join. Street Angel, Deadly Girl Alive, and Princess of Poverty, both available and in print from Image Comics. These are both self-contained. Read them in any order, and uh, probably about 20 stories total of the homeless ninja on a skateboard. And Hulk Grand Design, Treasury Edition, sold out. Trade paperback, available for pre-orders now. So if you have not picked that up yet, do so now. Let Marvel know they need to keep these books in print. The Switchblade Shorties Daily Strip has been going on for uh, since January 1st. It's on all of my social media. It's on Webtoon. It's on the Kayfabe social media streams, man. So check out uh, my latest comics project. I'm almost actually done uh, drawing the first book. Hip Hop Family Tree Omnibus is out there. Uh, you can find it real cheap on Amazon right now. It's like 45 bucks up there, which is crazy. Uh, 
This is the best book I've made to date. Contains all of my Hip Hop Family Tree works, plus 150 pages of extras. Scoop that thing up sooner than later. Uh, there are three flavors of Red Room trade paperbacks. Uh, the newest one coming at the end of February is called Crypto Killers. Uh, each one contains four complete stories. You don't need one to enjoy the other. So if Crypto Killers is your entryway, uh, no problem. And check it out if you dig it. Then go back and uh, read some of the other stories. And then there is the X-Men Grand Design Trilogy, which contains all of my uh, my X-Men Grand Design work. Some of that stuff is out, is out of print. The books are absolutely the most important thing required to keep the channel going. But there are some other ways to support the channel. Jimmy, let the people know. You can subscribe to the Cartoonist Kayfabe e-newsletter at the links below this video. You can also pick up Cartoonist Kayfabe t-shirts, merchandise, hats, mugs, stickers, and more at our spread shop. That link is also under this video. There you have it, man. Numerous ways to keep the channel rocking. Giving those marching orders, Jimmy, and we'll be on our way. Read more comics.